uh, welcome to what is then the first uh, seminar for the Center of Korean Studies in our seminar series this year. We had not had that much so far, uh, but we will have a, a number of, 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 of seminars and lectures now in term two. So my name is Anders Carlson, so I'm the, the chair of the Center of Korean Studies, and I'm also the, uh, the speaker for today. But before I start to talk about the topic, uh, I just wanted to say a few words as the, the center chair. So uh, I'll show you what we have planned so far uh, in terms of, of seminars. So uh, yes, so for today, then I'm going to give the first talk. Talk too much about that and uh, next Friday already uh, so the 5th of February it's Dr. Sang Pil Jin who is now at the University of Edinburgh as a postdoctoral fellow uh, who has his PhD in Korean history here from SOAS and so he's going to talk about efforts to neutralize the Korean peninsula uh, at the end of the 19th century early of the 20th century so this is based on and the book manuscript that he's working on, which in turn is, is based on his PhD dissertation. So that's going to be very interesting. Uh, on the 12th of February, it's Dr. Adam Bonnet from King's University College at Western University uh, in Canada. And he's going to talk about managing the descendants of Ming migrants in late Chos and Korea. And then once again, this is based on a book that just came out at the end of, of last year. Uh, in the, the book deals with different uh, groups of foreigners uh, in Korea in the Chosen period. Uh, in this talk, is going to look at Ming migrants. Into March, on the 19th of March, uh, Professor J.P. Park from the University of Oxford. So we're going to have a lecture on, on Korean art history. Uh, rescuing Art History from the Nation is the title, Late Chosen Korea between Europe and Edo, Japan. Uh, and then on the 26th, uh, we have Professor Hui Sang Cho from Emory University. Uh, and he's, once again, this is going to be a talk based on a recently published book uh, about epistolary practices in, in Chosen Korea. So having these events online has really helped us in, in terms of also inviting then colleagues from uh, the other side of the Atlantic. So uh, we're looking forward to these talks and uh, there at least one more in the pipeline uh, that we hope that we'll be able to announce soon. And uh, I'm very glad uh, what I can see, we have a good attendance. So uh, since I'm an in-house speaker, and since I also wanted to say a few words in the beginning as the center chair, that there will be no uh, other chair sent, uh, for, for, this, for this talk. So I will do all this myself. Uh, so as the, the chair of the talk then, uh, I would just like to, to ask you, so when, please, as, as, as I go through my talk, if you have any questions, if you could please put that in the Q&A box. Uh, and, and please don't put it in the chat box, please in, in the, the Q&A box. Uh, and then after the talk, uh, I will go back and then I will pick up on the questions uh, that you've had. So that's the instructions that have been given by Charles who kindly arranged all of these things. So I, I think it's time for me to start. Uh, there will be no one able to, to keep track of my time or, or keep me short. Uh, I, I will probably talk for an hour uh, or so, and that will give us time for, for questions so afterwards, or time for me to address uh, the questions that you have had. So I'll, I'll start the presentation. where I need to go. So what I want to talk about today uh, is a visit that a, a Swedish geographer uh, and explorer named Sven Edin made to Korea in 1908. Uh, 
those of you who know me, you know that this is not really the time period that I'm, I'm working on. Uh, so this is basically from the beginning, it was based on a, on a conference presentation that I gave back in 2019 when Sweden and, and South Korea, they were celebrating 60 years of diplomatic relations and, and they asked me to, to talk about something. And this is something that I, this visit or whatever was I've known about for a long time and I had interest in it. So uh, I proposed to talk about this. Uh, I, I had some apprehension uh, about it because it's the, the topic, as you will see, is not really celebratory of Swedish-Korean relations, and it's not very flattering to, to Sweden uh, in this, but uh, it was well received. And uh, I, I did some more research afterwards uh, to produce a, an article that's been published. And I thought it would be a good idea just to, to share that a, with a longer presentation with this additional research that I've done into the topic. So that's a little bit of the background. So the person in question then, uh, Sven Hedin, at the middle name, the same name as me, Sven Anders Hedin. Uh, so he's a geographer and an explorer. And uh, he's a, a famous and rather controversial figure in Sweden. As in the earliest, when, at the end of the 19th century, uh, in, in the early 20th century, up until the end of the 1920s. So, I mean, he was also a central figure in the scientific and cultural political life. Uh, uh, producing many books uh, based on his, his travels, but then of course also his, his explorations. And then he was also then internationally famous. Uh, he did uh, receive honorary doctoral titles from Oxford, Cambridge, Heidelberg, and, and München, and then all of his books uh, were translated into many languages. Uh, 22 it says on the, on the slide. So in the, in the beginning of the 20th century, he, he was very famous and his fame derived from, from and this is uh, the name that he was given, the last great explorer of Asia. He made some extensive expeditions to Central Asia, uh, exploring areas such as the Paklamakan Desert, Tibet, the Kunlun Mountain Range, uh, etc. cetera. And uh, as far as I know, he actually made some, some scientifically very important findings. And here is a, a map of his expeditions, so we can see where he mainly uh, conducted them. And the uh, expedition that he did just before visiting Japan and Korea, and uh, we can see is this one between 1906 and 1908, so it's predominantly then uh, Tibet and the Himalayas. Uh, starting off and, and returning back to, to northern India. Uh, in many ways, an, an interesting figure. As I said, he, he, he wrote voluminously I many his scientific treatises, more popular works about his expeditions. Uh, he, he wrote novels and was also a, a, a quite good of an, an artist. So he would also make drawings. Uh, during his, his expeditions. And here are some examples of that. Uh, unfortunately, it seems that he was too busy during his visit in, in East Asia to make any drawings, either in, in Japan or, or in Korea. I did say that, oh, sorry, I should have shown the slide like this. Yeah, sorry. Uh, as I said, he's, he's a controversial figure. Uh, into the 1930s, I mean, he was staunchly conservative. Uh, we will we'll see that in, in, in terms of his description of his visits to Japan and, and Korea. In the 1930s, he saw Nazi Germany as, as a protection uh, against the spread of, of communism uh, in, in Europe. Uh, he was invited to give a speech, which he did at the 1936 Olympic Games in, in Berlin as well. And then here's another infamous photo of him. Uh, so, so that's as is why, why he's a controversial figure. So from the 1930s onwards, then his, his 
involvement in, in politics and tarnished his, his reputation. Okay, uh, so where then do we find him writing about Korea? A very interesting feature is that through his travels, he, he wrote extensive letters to his parents. And uh, he, he was a composer writer, but also uh, he kept everything uh, in two copies of what he, he wrote as well. So he would keep a copy of all of his own letters. So, so we have that as a, 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 it's more like a, a diary of what he was doing, but in the form of letters to his parents. So we do have that. Uh, the first thing that we can see published after his visit is an obituary that he wrote in, in 1909 uh, over Ito Hirohumi. Then he reflects back upon when he met Ito in, uh, in Korea. Uh, in 1911, he wrote a popular book called Pole to Pole, uh, which was more aimed to, to young people. Uh, talking more about the kind of adventures that he had, and they do talk a little bit about his visit to Korea there, but uh, I, I will show you a little bit. It is not very informative. Uh, the, the main source is a, a collection of uh, biographical sketches uh, that wasn't published until 1950, that's called Great Men and Kings, in two volumes. Uh, and in that, he has one chapter about Ito Hirobumi, and also one chapter about Emperor Sun Jong, with whom he had uh, an audience uh, when he visited Seoul. Uh, so that is the main source, those two quite extensive texts that deals with his, his visit. So for the background, so why did he end up in first Japan and then uh, Korea? at the end of 1908. Uh, I've taken this story from some letters the, the at that time Swedish ambassador in, in Japan, Gustav Olof Wallenberg, uh, later on wrote to his more famous grandson, Raoul Wallenberg. And in that he, he is quite frankly talking about how the Swedish embassy had a role in this and what he personally or what role he had in, in that. Uh, so, so that's where I've taken this story from, how he was invited. And then his grandson, Mineral Wallenberg, is, is, is famous for me. He was a special envoy to the Swedish embassy in Budapest in 1944 and helped save many Hungarian Jews at that time. And then when the Red Army uh, to Budapest, and he, he was arrested uh, with suspicion of espionage, and then he just disappeared uh, after that. So that's why his, his letters has been published. That's why I find the story. So what does then Wallenberg tell us? So as the ambassador then, he, he met influential Japanese statesmen, and once he met Count Makino Nobuaki, and um, Nobuaki relayed to him some, some concerns that uh, the Japanese government had uh, about tensions with, with Great Britain. Uh, so uh, the way that Wallenberg put it is, is, is that Great Britain had supported uh, Japan in the Russo-Japanese war and then expected to have some kind of leverage or influence in Japan. And when that didn't materialize, Japan started to get bad press in Japan and, and, and Japan started to be called the, the Prussia of the East, just being interested in, in military expansion. Uh, and what Wallenberg says is Makino asked if the Swedish envoy could find a practical solution to the situation. And, uh, and here I quote what he, he writes in, in those letter, uh, in that letters. He said, I, I said to Makino, if the English have persuaded the rest of the world that Japan is interested only in war, now you will have to find a way to convince everyone of your interest in cultural matters and science and their practitioners. Uh, they can provide good publicity if you give them any reason to. Uh, he continued, well, it seems fairly likely that Dr. Sven Hebin, who is currently in Tibet and who I know is about to go home, 
uh, could be persuaded to pass through Japan and give some lectures here. Uh, probably staged, uh, they might afford you an excellent opportunity to demonstrate to the world that uh, Japanese interest in scientific questions and thus refute the English accusations. And this was something uh, that was picked up by, by, by the Japanese. Uh, Wallenberg says that he, he later received a, a visit uh, uh, by a delegation headed by the, the president of Kyoto University. That they, they wouldn't go, go ahead with this. And Wallenberg also says that uh, they had been instructed to, to offer a, a check of 3,000 yen to Hedin for this. But then Wallenberg said that he, he realized that if he declined that on behalf of Hedin, he would get more leverage for the Swedish embassy uh, afterwards for this. Uh, so when Van Hedin then finished his travels in Tibet, he, he returned back to Northern India. Uh, and here are some photos uh, when he was in Simla with the, the Earl of, of Minto and he, he gave a, a lecture there as well about his travels. Uh, and then when he was in India, that was when he received this invitation then to, uh, to visit Japan. And that was an invitation that was extended by the Nippon Geography Association. Uh, he accepted the invitation uh, and then uh, traveled to Shanghai. Uh, and this is the map he himself produced, which is in the book Pole to Pole of his, of his travels. Uh, as he was making his journey to Japan, then the Swedish ambassador, Wallenberg, he reported back to Sweden concerning newspaper coverage in Japan, uh, saying that the country was full of anticipation, not only because Hedin was the world's biggest explorer, but also because it gave the Japanese the opportunity to show that they were just as interested in peaceful conquest as in military triumphs. So the ones again, that, that kind of message that Wallenberg is, is pushing. Uh, his itinerary traveled to Nagasaki and then to Kobe, and then was greeted by another delegation, and this time sent by Otani Kutsui, abbot of the Buddhist Nishihonganji sect in, in Kyoto, uh, who himself had been involved in expeditions to, to Central Asia, uh, fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, uh, and he would also then uh, take care of uh, and cater Hedin during his, his stay in Japan. I will not talk that much about his stay in, in Japan. That's not the purpose here. Even though in, in his writings, he do talk quite a lot about the people that he met there. But anyway, he stayed in Japan for a month uh, between the 12th, 12th of November and 13th of December. Having, he had an audience with the Japanese emperor. And according once again to the Swedish ambassador, he was a big hit. Uh, giving multiple talks and receptions being held in his honor almost every day. Uh, he being himself in one of his letters to his parents, jokingly told his parents that the visit to Japan was more exhausting uh, than the exploration that he just had done in, in Tibet. Uh, but this this made a great impression on, on Hedin, his, his, his stay in, in Japan. So then the visit to Korea, which is the main interest in today's talk. So it, it's not clear from either what he writes or what I've been able to find in other sources, how that was arranged. Uh, I've been able to find that Ito Hirobumi actually was in Japan uh, when Hedin made his visit, but as I said, that there's, Hedin himself has not made any reference to having met uh, Ito Hirobumi in uh, Japan. Once again, Wallenberg, the ambassador, he states that he even extended his stay, uh, which then indicates that this visit was planned when he was already in Japan. In a sense, also, I think that the Swedish diplomat regarded Korea as part of, of, of Japan. He was not traveling further, was traveling to another country. Uh, in the books, Great Men, Men and Kings, then uh, he did himself mentioned that he had actually planned to visit Beijing on his way back home from Japan, but he was then unable to do that because of the death of the Chinese emperor on the 14th of November. And then the empress dowager on, on the following day. Uh, otherwise, in, in terms of one 
one step might have been decided. I found in the Hwang Sang Shin Moon uh, a report from the 4th of December stating that Hedin was on his way to Seoul. So it was decided before that, at least. And here we can see then how he traveled to Korea and then traveled straight up to, to Seoul. Uh, his, his visit uh, was mentioned in, in Korea before he came. As in Chen Nam Sun's new magazine, Sonyeon, they did have this one page uh, short article uh, about his visit. Uh, I, I read you know, what it says. We have always admired and venerated those loyal gentlemen who throw away fame and fortune and exert all their power and effort for the sake of cultural progress. And so now when we hear that Sven Edin is coming, how can we but respectfully greet and express our admiration and respect? What kind of person is he? He is the most famous explorer in the world today and from the end of the last century to the beginning of this, he has sacrificed body and life for science and art, exploring the darkest corners of the world. So uh, it, it seems that he, he, he was invited as a guest of the Japanese, but there was interest in most Koreans as well for his visit. Uh, he, he, he described that the travel from uh, Busan up to Seoul in uh, pole to pole. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's just description of the nature uh, that he's seeing. Uh, I think for the sake of time, I, I will not read this. Uh, but I mean, he's, he's a very good writer and it gives a very good description of, of what he is seeing. But uh, he was arrived then, we're told, in, in Seoul on December the 13th and, and took in at the Sonpak Hotel, so the, the, the allegedly first European style hotel in Seoul, a hotel that has an interesting history in itself. And uh, once again, for which there is not time today. That's what, where he stayed. Uh, he does, once again, in, in Pole to Pole, this book that he wrote more for young people, describing more the adventurous side of his, his travels. He does have a description of, uh, of Seoul, uh, accompanied with this illustration. Uh, and I'll read through this. So uh, the town is confined in a valley between bare cliffs. And from the heights, all that can be seen is confusion of gray and white houses with gabled roofs covered with gray tiles. In the Japanese quarter, life goes on exactly as in Japan. Rows of colored paper lanterns hang now at night before the open shops and trade is brisk and lively. In the Korean quarters, the lanes are narrow and dismal, but the principal streets are wider with tram cars rattling amid the varied Asiatic scenes. Here are sedan chans, caravans of big oxen laden with firewood, heavy carts with goods, men carrying unusually heavily loads of, on the framework of wooden ribs on their backs, uh, women sailing past in white garments and a veil over their veil over their smooth plated hair. A row of grown men and boys pass through the streets carrying boards with Korean inscriptions in red and white. Those are advertisements. And before them marches a drum and flute band filling the streets with a hideous noise. That's a vivid description of what he saw in, in Seoul. Uh, so, of course, Ito Hirobumi is going to play a, a central part in his, his visit. Uh, unfortunately, Sven Edin himself is not that informative about the earlier stages of his visit, and in particular not giving much dates. But, but what I found is that, that Ito actually had left uh, Seoul, so he had returned to Korea from Japan before Hedin's arrival, but then left Seoul on the 15th of December for an official trip to Kaesong to inspect Ginseng, and his, what I've been able to find out, returned to Seoul the following day. Uh, in Great Men and Kings, uh, Hedin has an interesting description of what I understand to be him hearing Ito coming back then from that visit to Kaesong. Uh, so Hedin describes how when he was sitting and talking with some friends 
uh, in the hall after a lecture that he had given. Uh, they heard horses outside and saw a carriage pass. Uh, Hedin was told that it was Itoi returning from official business. Uh, he writes, the Japanese, uh, sorry, the conversation fell silent. Uh, my Japanese friends turned serious and stood up. You could feel that it was a dictator that had passed by. Uh, as, as we will see, uh, Sven Hedin has a lot of praise for, for Ito, so uh, I don't think that was a critical remark uh, made by him. Uh, in another rendition of the same story, he called him rather Caesar than a, a, a dictator. Uh, he mentions he never gives the date of, of an early visit that he made to, to Ito Hiragumi. And he says that that uh, visit was also attended by uh, Lee Wan Yong, the Korean Prime Minister, uh, as well as the Japanese General Hasegawa Yoshimichi, so we can see here, and uh, the Vice Resident General Sona Arasuke, that we can see here. Uh, so General Hasegawa then in, in, in charge of the Japanese troops in, in Korea at that time. Uh, and then, of course, he and later on in, in 1916, comes back to become governor general uh, and being responsible for the harsh suppression of the March 1st movement. And vice resident general Sonara Suki in, in 1909, then succeeding Ito Hirobumi as the resident general. Uh, unfortunately, he does not tell us more about what they talked about, what happened during that meeting. He says that the same day he visited the Kyongbuk and Changbuk palaces, uh, after which in the evening gave a lecture to an audience of 1,500, followed by a large dinner party. And that seems to be the, the pattern both in Japan and Korea. The following day, uh, given a lecture by a Mr. Noye on Korean history and Japan's policies and plans for the protectorate. And he, he does relay in his writing quite a lot of the information that he did receive. And uh, it, it's very much echoing uh, the kind of, not in terms of Korean history, but in terms of Japan's policies, uh, what at that time was being produced in these reports uh, on reforms and, and progress in, in Japan that was part of both Japan's effort to uh, improve the, the international image of, of, of Japan and what they would do, of course, after the, the, the Hague Peace Conference in, in 1907. It, it's, it seems to be part of, of that kind of propaganda effort that we can see around uh, this time, which of course also involved the, the translation into English of uh, all of the treaties that had led up to the, the protectorate that then around slightly earlier than this, uh, I think it was, it was published in the American Journal of International Law. Anyway, so he, he was fed then that, that same kind of, of information. Well, he said he gave another lecture attended by the Consul General from Germany, the US, France, Great Britain, and, and Russia, and followed by a dinner with a number of Japanese dignitaries. Uh, from the 18th of December onwards, we get a little bit more, more solid knowledge about what, what he, he was doing. We have some dates, etc. He says that he started off the day with a lunch. Uh, visiting the Russian Consul General, Alexander Zomov. Uh, not much interesting to talk about uh, in terms of that, but I mean, there aren't that many photographs from his visit, uh, but the Sven Hedin Foundation had these photos. Uh, unfortunately, uh, oxidated and, and damaged. Uh, so, but I, I thought I, I'd show them. I said, I'll show some other photos. Uh, but, some of the few field photos that we can see. Uh, it seems to be him leaving uh, and him being considerably shorter than the Russian uh, consul general, the, the, with consideration that the Russian consul steps down <laughs> on the stairs and then with the wife and uh, the son as well. Uh, then on the same day, uh, there was a, a formal audience uh, with Ito Hirobumi, who Sven uh, throughout his descriptions of it called Korea's ruler. Uh, this meeting then he says uh, was also accompanied by two Japanese generals, uh, 
Murata Murata Tsuneyoshi and Akashi Motojiro. Murata to the, the left in the photo and Akashi to the, to the right. Uh, both of them have been military attaches in, in, in Stockholm and they carried the Swedish orders of the sword. And presumably, that's why they were, were part of the uh, meeting uh, as well. And uh, General Akashi uh, was the one that, that organized the, the Japanese military police in, in Korea. And he was later in 1918 to become the governor general of, of Taiwan. Um, here, Sven Hedin from, from this visit relays some, some, some interesting discussions that he had with, with Ito. And, and, and Ito quite quickly came to what was, from the Japanese point of view, the, the important purpose of his visit in, in Seoul. And once again, this is what, what Dean uh, relays from, from the discussions, and this is from his the, the chapter on Ito Hirobumi in the Great Men and Kings book. Uh, so Ito said, moreover, you must have a look for yourself and judge. I have ordered these gentlemen to give you all the information you need. I ask you to take notes during your stay here and then write about Korea, not only for the Swedish people, but for all Europeans and afterwards ask them if my policies had not been justified if any other great power in our position would have acted differently. And so basically asking him to, to, to convey them that the Japanese propaganda about what they were doing in, uh, in Korea. Uh, Hedin says that, that Ito seemed very relaxed and, and, and then made various jokes and, and then saying that soon Japan would control East Asia all the way to the Baikal Lake, but you don't need to, to spill that secret to the times as yet. Etc. Etc. So uh, he had quite long discussions with with Ito. Um, here is a, a photograph that I understand to have been taken in relation once again with that meeting, because when you see these two generals and some other Japanese dignitaries, uh, the only one I've been able to identify is Kiyuchi that we see here, who. Uh, it was critical of, of Ito Hirobumi's, what he considered Ito Hirobumi's to the lenient kind of policies in, uh, in Korea. Okay. When he was in Seoul, he gave a talk at uh, the YMCA. And, and, and this is, as far as I can see, that the only kind of interaction that he had with Koreans and then and, and all the places which Koreans then took the initiative uh, of inviting him to something. Otherwise, it seems to have been uh, the Japanese or the, the Western legations uh, in Seoul. Uh, unfortunately, I have not been able to find so much information about it. What he writes himself is uh, that when the Koreans saw how the Japanese cared for me, they probably thought that they should not let themselves be outdone and they sent a delegation to politely invite me uh, to give a lecture in the big hall of the YMCA. And of course, it would then be the, the newly constructed uh, YMCA, YMCA building that had been opened just before his, his visit on, on, on Chongno. Uh, he says that there were some complications uh, in all of this, that the Koreans had made the demand that no Japanese should be present. Uh, Hedin says that he found this requirement somewhat confrontational and asked Ito how he should proceed. And according to him, Ito answered that he saw no problems with this, uh, but is within quotation marks, gentlemen, so I guess his advisors would have a different opinion, uh, advised Hedin not to participate in any manifestation against uh, the Japanese. Uh, so what happened in the end was that uh, Hedin made the demand that at least two Japanese should be invited to this talk at the YMCA as well. Once again, he says that the, the organizers were, they reluctantly agreed to that. Uh, um, in the end, then the event was attended by uh, Mr. Moya, who we have here on the photo, who, who was the person that had given Hedin, the, the lecture on Korean history, but also Japanese policies, uh, and a uh, Mr. Hori, who we can see here on the photo. I'm afraid I don't know who he was. 
uh, this lecture it was advertised broadly in, in the newspapers. I found it both in Bangsan Shinmun and the Teha Mail Shinbo. Uh, the heading was Lecture on Traveling Around the World. And it seems that advertisement was sponsored by Yu Chi Ho, which was an educator and, and a younger cousin of the more famous Yu Chi Ho. Uh, in the letters back to his parents, uh, he then uh, wrote uh, that 2,000 people participated who came uh, to his talk. Uh, all Koreans except the two Japanese and also two Europeans who came. Uh, he says that the hall was so crowded that late comes at the city the and uh, he commented that he saw only about 50 people in Western clothing, the rest wore Korean clothes, uh, and that they had an interpreter and spoke for two hours and afterwards uh, there was a very crowded time. Uh, so that is what he tells us about his, his lecture at the YMCA. Uh, he had audiences uh, when he was there. And on December the 20th, both Wang Sang Shinmun and Tell Me Shinmun was again reported that he had an audience with uh, Ko Jong. And unfortunately, and, and that was, should have been together with Ito Hirobumi. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't, never himself wrote about that. Uh, there is no trace of it in, in official uh, sources. Uh, we know much more than about the audience that we had we had with, with Sun Jong. Of course, we can find it in, in the Korean sources. Uh, it, it's referred to in the Korean newspapers as well. It was also in the Shilok and the, the Ilsung Nok. Uh, and he writes about it, of course, extensively in that chapter in Great Man and King's book. And uh, he, he really admits to his, his ignorance. Uh, so talking about Sun Jong, there won't be many, if any, in the West that have heard the name of the monarch uh, that I will now pay some attention to in this gallery. I gladly confess that I, at the time of my arrival in Korea, wasn't at all aware that the last emperor still existed. Uh, I had myself not thought about the fallen throne, and no one among my Japanese friends had mentioned a word about the ruler whose power and authority had been taken over by, by Ito. So yeah, it's not surprising that, that he was ignorant of, of this, but it is interesting to, he makes the point that it, no one had, had in all of these kind of discussions and preparation and when he was in Japan really mentioned uh, the Korean emperor. Uh, but then one day when we were talking in his reception room, Ito suddenly said, would it amuse you to meet the last emperor of Korea? It could after all be an interesting memory for you to have once in your life, to have once in your life seen and talked to him, even if it only is for the curiosity of it. I mean, throughout his description, uh, he, he really, he doesn't say so explicitly, but really shows the kind of condescending tone that, that the Ito and, and the people around him had when they talked about uh, Sun Jong. Ito would have continued, well, you see, this will be the last opportunity, uh, even though the emperor might still be on his throne, his definite dethronement will happen tomorrow and afterwards he will become a private person, a political prisoner under my, that is Japan's rule. And uh, either Ito was speaking figuratively or Hedin's memory is not serving him well because that never happened. Uh, but presumably Ito gave the impression, of course, that, that very soon uh, Sun Jian was going to be dethroned. Uh, on the 21st of December then, Hedin went to the palace for an audience scheduled at 11 a.m. and he was met there by Sone, the vice resident general and once again General Hasegawa. And once again, in his description, we, we can see how the Japanese tried to belittle and, and ridicule Sun Jong. Uh, but in the end, in Hedin, he, he was an, an admirer of anything royal, great men, etc. And his description of, of the audience with Sun Jong is actually this is full of sympathy uh, for the ruler and also for the Korean cause. And just seeing what was going on in Korea at that time as an inevitable course of, of history. 
And as I said, his, his description is, 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 is interesting. So I'll quote quite a lot uh, from what he, he talked about his, his uh, audience with, with Sun Zhong. Uh, so he says that due to the political developments that by the time of my visit uh, in the Far East turned the old kingdom of Korea into a Japanese protectorate, and the last emperor appeared a tragic figure, a representative of an epoch that maybe indefinitely was sinking into the world of shadows to thereafter belong to the records of memories lost, that is, world history. Uh, escorted by the two Japanese dignitaries and marched into the audience hall, a middle-sized oblong room as unassuming as anyone could imagine. Uh, the white plastered walls lacked any kind of decoration. Uh, the floor was partly covered with cheap rugs uh, and the only furniture in the room was the imperial chairs that form a group at the far end. Uh, on one of them, all that was left of the throne now gone was the former emperor, uh, seated in what little was left of his past glory. Uh, Staffan Rosen, who used to be a, a professor at Queen's Studies at, at Stockholm University, was interested in this. He, he thinks that uh, this audience happened in the Sunjong Jung Changdokun Palace. Uh, and it, that is possible. The records seem to indicate that it had been. Uh, westernized slightly around this time. Uh, continue to quote, uh, but in solitude he was certainly not lacking. He had been abandoned by God and the whole world, uh, but maybe not by his own people. Uh, the fate that a couple of years later befell the man that seized the throne from him, and if folks talking about uh, the death of Ito Hirogumi, it was the manifestation of the Korean people's will uh, and their desire to have the emperor back on the throne of his ancestors. Uh, the emperor was, a very, was very simply dressed. He was wearing a long white gown with white sleeves and without any kind of decorations. He wore the usual Korean high black hat without brim or peak. I approached him and bowed in European manner. He stood up friendly, stretched forward his hand for a shake and offered me to sit down in the chair opposite his. Uh, the emperor spoke in Korean to the Korean interpreter who translated into Japanese to the Japanese interpreter who in turn translated the sentences into English to me. Uh, my answer of course went the reverse order and when the conversation goes through two interpreters it takes three longer, three times longer than otherwise and therefore we could have no in-depth discussions. Uh, how has your trip been? For long did, how long did you stay in Tibet? I have heard about the difficulties you had to overcome, especially cold weather and blizzards. I also know that you visited other parts of Asia. Uh, what part did you enjoy most? Uh, what route will you take back to your country? What are the best preparations for a journey in Tibet? And so on. The conversation continued. Uh, not a word about Korea, Japan, or China. So, written quite long after the, the audience, uh, but had been kept detailed notes. Uh, so presumably this is the kind of discussions that they're having. So uh, the kind of impression that is giving us is having a, a quite kind of informed knowledge uh, about his travels, etc. and just making the point that actually did not talk about anything political, talking about Korea, Japan, or China uh, around that time. I will come back to his description of the audience with Sun Jung towards the end. Um, he describes how before this audience, uh, he was awarded with the Korean order of the Palgwe, of the Palgwe Jang, uh, that had been given since, since 1901. Uh, and, and once again, the way he describes this shows the kind of condescending tone uh, that the Japanese were using. So with feigned solemnity and sincere irony, this comes on and declare that this was the last time in world history that the eighth trigram order would be bestowed upon a human being and hung on a tail coat. And, and as far as I know, this is the actual order that he did receive. Uh, and this is one of the few things that have left, left a more extensive uh, paper trail in the Korean bureaucracy. Uh, 
been able to find some documents quite repetitive, but still in the Q Tangak uh, that relates to this. So, so the award was first discussed at the Korean cabinet on December the 17th. Uh, so we, we don't know when that was decided for in the, in the beginning of how this was planned, but it, it seems to have been once again, the decision taken quite late. Uh, the same day, Prime Minister Lee Wan Yong sent a letter to Lee Chae Guk, who was the director of the Department of Medals and Awards, the pure Lee Won, uh, explaining how the resident general had mentioned Hadin's visit to Korea and asked the cabinet to award him with this order. Uh, so he received it on the 21st. It was announced in Korean newspapers on the 22nd, uh, but it was not officially announced until uh, the 6th of January 1909. Uh, so it, it seems it might have been because he, he was just there for a short time that they wanted to give it to him quickly before all of the paperwork actually had been finished because that was not finished what I could see until the 5th of, of January. Uh, but it also indicates a little bit the kind of high handedness that the Japanese showed in uh, in this. And, and actually in, in, in Hedin's own words, what he said was that, that it was bestowed on him by Ito Hirobumi, rather than the Korean emperor. And the reason stated for him getting this uh, was his extensive knowledge of geography and extensive contributions to the world based on this scholarship. So once again, paying attention to that, uh, his role as some kind of important cultural and scientific figure in the period. Uh, reaching the end of his visit, so on the evening after his audience uh, with Sun Jong, uh, which would be then his last in Seoul. He was invited to reception at the American General Consulate together with Ito Irobumi and, and various high-ranking Japanese officials. Not much to say about that, but we do have a photograph uh, from that dinner reception. You can see Hedin here and then Ito Hirobumi. So we have Sone at the table. Okay. Uh, the following day, then he left Seoul on the train from Namdaemun Station, being sent off by a large group of Japanese and Koreans. As he arrived in Xin Uiju, the border to China in the evening, and stayed one night and the next morning crossed the Yalu to take the train from Dandong to, to Shenyang. And uh, he, he describes this and once again it's in his pole to pole, which is more about the adventurous part of his travels. And it's just the river had just begun to freeze over and the ice was still so thin that it could be seen bending in great waves under the weight of our sledge. Uh, the Chinaman pushed along at great speed with a long iron shot pole. However, he reached the other side safely and then he went to Port Arthur and he stayed. And then in the end, he took the Trans-Siberian Railway to Moscow. And so in the end, then to, to, to conclude uh, my kind of discussions of, of this, so we, we've seen where it all started. So, so he was invited to Japan uh, to help improve the image of, of Japan and then invited to Korea. It seems to, to spread a, as well a more positive image of what the Japanese were doing in, uh, in Korea. Uh, so did this pay off? For the Japanese. And then when he arrived in Moscow, then he started to give the first kind of longer interviews with Korean with European newspapers. And he does say that the treatment he had received by the Japanese impressed him. Uh, he did acknowledge Japan's control of Korea. Uh, but at this stage, beyond that, he did not convey much of the Japanese propaganda. Uh, it, it seems that from his Eurocentric perspective, it was rather than the, the Russo-Japanese war that, that was in his mind in terms of, of Japan's significance. Uh, so uh, this is from an interview with the London Evening Standard. And there he says, I have received kindness everywhere in India and in Russia, but never in my life have anywhere experienced anything like the reception I got in Japan. Uh, I was received by the Mikado, uh, but perhaps the honor which most impressed me itself, pressed itself upon me was a banquet given to me by the Japanese general staff with all the famous men there who went through the war and in the chairs with General Oku, which is believed to have really won the fight. I think then I simply can't describe you the reception. 
Uh, I can imagine nothing to equal it anywhere. I came through Korea, being entertained at Seoul by Marcus Ito, royally. Yes, Korea is practically a Japanese province now. And all of the comfortable traveling in the world, even with the Japanese section of the Manchurian line, there are marvelous people, a wonderful nation. So yeah, uh, as he comes back, he talks in very positive terms about the Japanese, but also what they were doing in, uh, in Korea, back in Sweden. Uh, he made occasional references to Japan's ruling in Korea during his many speeches. Uh, so he, he was a celebrity in, in Sweden at one once he got back and was invited in many, many places to give talks. Uh, January the 23rd of 1909, for instance, uh, during a speech in Stockholm to school children that were celebrating his return. Uh, he related a story about how when he visited the Japanese school in Seoul, a 12 year old Japanese boy in a model show of patriotism had addressed him in impeccable English and explained about Japan's peaceful intentions in Korea and that it just wanted to reinstate calm and happy conditions uh, for the Korean people. Of course, when retelling this story, it's not really about Japan and, and Korea, but rather about the patriotic young boy who would like to see as an example for, for Swedish youth. Uh, a kind of ironic twist of fate uh, I mean, it was basically in, in the obituary that he wrote about Ito Hirobumi after Ito's death in, in 1909, and that occasioned Hedin to write the kind of full-fledged praise of, of Japanese policies in Korea that Ito had asked for. But then, of course, in the end, it, it is quite limited so in, in the Swedish newspaper. Uh, two packed pages, so there's a lot of information in it, but of course, it did not. reach such a, a wide audience. Uh, he outlined Ito's life, described their meeting in Seoul, but then they gave a long and, and laudatory account of the policies Ito had implemented as, as resident general. Uh, as I said, he, he had this liking of, of royal people and, and great men. And it's interesting to notice that, that he has more emphasis on what, what Ito was doing. And it, it does also indicate that uh, there were Japanese people who are critical of what Ito was doing there, and in the end, he, he, he describes it. Maybe it's in, in the framework of, of, of an obituary, but anyway, as uh, kind of accomplishments of this person, Ito Hirobumi. Uh, okay, so uh, to a certain extent, yes, it, it seems that the Japanese got what they wanted uh, in pole to pole. Once again, in this book for, for younger people, he said that the signs of Japan's peaceful conquest of Korea are everywhere apparent. Uh, Japanese guards, policemen, soldiers, and officials are seen at the stations. Uh, the country now contains more than 200,000 Japanese settlers from Japan, however, uh, take up their residence only for a time in the far country. Uh, for example, a landowner in Japan will sell half of his property there, and with the proceeds buy land in Korea three or four times as large as all his estate in the home country, and fertility at least as good. Uh, there he farms for some years and then returns home with the profits he had earned. Uh, numbers of Japanese fishermen also come yearly to the coasts of Korea with their boats and return home to Japan with their catch. Thus, Korea is deluged with Japanese of all kinds. The army is Japanese, Japanese fortresses are erected along the northern frontier, the government and officials are Japanese, and soon Korea will become simply a part of the land of the rising sun. Uh, which, of course, this was published in 19, oh, 1911, so it was already after the, the annexation. So yeah, another example of that. So uh, did it pay off for Sweden? Uh, the Swedish ambassador Wallenberg was quite smug uh, about it. He, he was satisfied. He says that Sweden became famous overnight in Japan. Uh, four years later, he boasts Sweden was third in terms of Japanese imports uh, behind only England and Germany. Uh, and so what about Korea uh, in all of this? Uh, so I mean, it, it seems that his visit was important for Koreans and reformers like Chen Nam Son uh, as well. Uh, and this kind of notion that, that science and, and knowledge uh, was important in reforming the state. Uh, the, the way in which this kind of uh, the advertisement for the YMCA uh, was phrased is something for all 
people engaged in, in the destiny of our country to come and listen to this talk, uh, etc. Uh, so it, it, it seems to have been important for them as well. And uh, Sonia published then a second text about Hedin in 1909. Uh, and this lengthier piece not only gave a biographical sketch, uh, but also described his exhibitions uh, and then talked about his visit uh, to Korea. It stressed how the citizens of Seoul had welcomed him and cherished his visit. And then as for the order of the Palgue, that awarded to Hedin, although it was given on Japanese initiative, as we have seen uh, in, in Sonyan, then it says it was meaningful because now that it was for the first time really uh, awarded to someone worthy uh, of it. Um, anecdotally, but it's <laughs> interesting to see that, that for some reason in this uh, second article in, in Sonian, they, they, they say that Sven Hedin is going to get married when he gets back to Sweden and, and they wish him all the best in his future married life. Uh, Sven Hedin never got married. And as far as I know, there was no plan for him to get married when I got back either. So uh, it seems to me that, that he and he might not have been the only one who had that experience was asked a lot about if he was married. And there was a lot of awkward following up questions when he said that he wasn't married. So presumably he said, well, I'm going to get married when I get back. OK, the the last slides and I said, yeah, for, for Hedin, the way he describes this, I mean, he talks a lot about he's been very impressed by Japan and what Ito Hirobumi was doing in, in Korea. He was very impressed by that. Uh, but throughout his, his writing, there's also sympathy shown for Korea. Uh, and it, it seems that for him, it, it was not really so much about the question of taking sides uh, in, in all of this. It was just unfold his view or observing and a historical kind of drama uh, unfolding. And I will end my talk uh, with the way he ends his description of Sun Jong and his audience with, with Sun Jong. Uh, so he says, so this audience must have been embarrassing for the former emperor. There is no doubt that it must have been humiliating to be displayed as a faded star with no reflection of his former glory. He must have felt like a tiger in a cage overseen by his conqueror. Uh, but of that he showed nothing. He was dignified and sympathetic acted very politely and seemed to be listening to my answers with sincere interest. In the deepest corners of his mind, he must have thought that I was the last to visit him for a formal audience and the old ways were lost and his power and glory had been extinguished by his powerful neighbors. Uh, there was a trace of sadness in his calm and settled face. I shall never forget the look of sorrow and solitude he gave me when he slowly and with dignity stood up to bid me farewell. Uh, heavy and humiliating years awaited him. When death finally knocked on his door, he must have greeted him like a liberator, a potentate power more powerful than the Japanese emperor, a savior in triumph would escort him to his ancestors on the other side. So I'll finish my talk with that slide. So, and... Uh, can see that there so far. Okay, slideshow mode, please. Yes, I did that. Mm, okay, uh, Yuna Kim, you have a, a question asking. So, uh, if I could tell you more about the ways in which a Swedish diplomat had come to regard Korea as part of Japan at that time. As far as I know, Sun Jung still acted as the king. Uh, although his support for it was fragile and was shaped by the, the pro-Japanese officials. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Swedish ambassador's views on, on, on this, I, I would say, would predominantly be based on uh, ignorance uh, and also what kind of information he was given by the Japanese. So uh, and he does not really talk more about that in, in detail. Uh, so, uh, we, we, we can see that what the way Svenedin also describes the kind of information that he gave was given by the Japanese that they never mentioned Sun Jong to him at all uh, before he came there. And as a, he, he constantly refers to, to Ito as, as Korea's ruler, uh, etc. So I think that is the, the, the kind of background behind that. 
I mean, Hedin, at least he, he admitted to his ignorance uh, in all of this. I'll see if there are any questions in the chat. Uh, so when this exchange happened, uh, so that should have been, if it's not stated, uh, Wallenberg does not say when this happened, but it was then in autumn of 1908, and when that should have happened. And that was a question from, from Roger Macy. I said that the, 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 the story is told in an informal way in, 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 in a letter written much later than in a bit informal letter to his uh, grandchild. Uh, yeah, there's a question from, from Chan He uh, Lee. So uh, if this has not been highlighted uh, by scholars in Korea, yeah, it's, uh, there are some scholars that have, have touched upon this briefly. I mean, most of them would have come to his visit through what's written in, in Sonyan. Uh, when I prepared my, my talk, my, my, my first talk, and also when I prepared the article, I've been in contact with Korean scholars, and many of them saying, oh yeah, this is something that I wanted to look into, but I haven't done that. Uh, I, mean, as, as, I think you can see from my talk uh, that there is not, not, there is not that much information uh, available, and that's why this talk, I, I guess, ends up being a little bit journalistic. Uh, just trying to extract everything uh, that could be, be found about it. Uh, yeah. Uh, he did not uh, receive many gifts, no. What, what I know that he, the, the, the central piece is the order uh, that he did receive, and that is in, in, in Stockholm now. There was a question from, from Charlotte Horlick, uh, Dr. Horlick. Uh, this is not something that I myself have looked into. He doesn't talk about it. Uh, the, the Ethnographic Museum in, in, in Stockholm, they have a huge collection uh, from, from, from Stamadine, but of course that, that would be predominantly from, from his expeditions. There might be things in there, but he's not written about it, and I mainly looked at his, his, his written sources. Any other questions? And it in, in terms of the Japanese having some kind of success in this, uh, back in, in Sweden, uh, Sven Hedin uh, persuaded uh, at that time famous Swedish political scientist who was also quite far to the right, Rudolf Schilling, uh, to make a, a longer visit to Japan. Uh, and, and Rudolf Chilean after his visit then wrote uh, about that as well. Uh, very positive book that he, he wrote about uh, Japan. Any other questions? Okay, a question from David Hall. Uh, if you know anything about the food drink he had while he was in Korea, uh, did he try Korean cuisine or stick mostly to Western food? He does not mention food at all. Uh, I mean, he stayed uh, at the Sontak Hotel and then uh, he, he, he was invited to, to various 
foreign legations. So I don't think that he would have experienced much uh, Korean food. He, he does say that after the YMCA talk, there was this reception and there was a buffet, uh, but he says it was so crowded and you really needed sharp elbows to, to get near the food. And he doesn't mention anything about the actual food. Uh, so unfortunately, no, he did not say anything about the food. <laughs> Another question from, from Dr. Horlick. Uh, is it true that he was one of the most famous explorers at the time? When I talk about him in, in, in classes, I, I jokingly say that he was world famous in Sweden. Uh, but I actually do think that at that time he he was famous around the world. I mean, it is reflected in, in terms of all the, the publications that were translated and not very flattering to him, but it said that, that Adolf Hitler was, was a great fan of, of, of his, uh, etc. So uh, I, I do believe that, yes. And uh, as far as I know also, many in terms of the kind of scientific findings, uh, he, he did make some, some quite important contributions to it. So uh, I do believe that to be the case, yes. Uh, an anonymous question, to what extent uh, did his accounts or journals serve as propaganda tools to justify the Japanese colonization? Uh, I mean, it is difficult to talk about it as, as tools. I mean, uh, the, the, the visit of what happened in 1908, yes, it, it's true that what he wrote afterwards uh, it, it did give a very positive evaluation of uh, what the Japanese were doing. Uh, and I, I found a, a telegram back to, to from, from the Japanese embassy in, in Stockholm after he had published that long uh, obituary uh, about Ito Hirobumi in 1909 as well. So that the Japanese, uh, that they, they kept an eye on, on what he was publishing uh, and what he did say. Uh, so um, yeah, that, that as far as I understand it, I mean, the, the purpose of his visit both to Japan and to Korea would be to, to improve the, the image of, of Japan, and of course that would be could be an extension of in the extension of some kind of propaganda for later on then the, the annexation. So uh, Daniel Byrne Webster, so how is he viewed in Sweden now? Are people proud of his legacy, or has his reputation not aged well? Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's controversial. And, and I think people know of him more because of his involvement in politics. I mean, the era of, of having explorers as, as idols to, to look up to, uh, etc. Of course, that is gone by now. And uh, what people do look into is I mean, the more kind of prob it depends on your political outlook. I mean, uh, uh, he, he had always been very conservative. Uh, he, uh, from the beginning, was very much engaged in, in, in political and geopolitical discussions. Uh, in, in the beginning, that would have been more in terms of Scandinavia and Scandinavia's relation to Russia, uh, etc. But of course, from the 1930s onwards, uh, in, in Europe in, in general, so I would not say that, that people would be proud of his legacy. No, he is more considered to be a problematic person. Yeah. Okay, if there aren't any more questions, uh, maybe we can stop for today. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, it, it is frustrating not to be able to see you, just to talk to a screen. At the moment, I'm talking to myself uh, on the screen. Uh, I do hope that you come back next week, so next Friday, when it's Dr. Sang Pil Jin, who's going to give 
this talk. So hope to see you all next Friday. Thank you very much. Thank you.